Hi, welcome to TVS Pro. I'm Ted Bollinger. This is Mike Bollinger and this is Chris Deering. Chris is the owner and operator of Deep Dive AV and a writer for Sound and Vision. Chris, welcome to Salt Lake. Thank you. Um, today we're going to be comparing for the first time the Theo Lite and the JVC NX7 with the new 3.1 firmware. Chris, tell us, Chris came to calibrate the JVC to technical standards and tell us a little bit about 3.1 and how the calibration went. Thanks. Uh, calibration went great. Uh, the JVCs always calibrate real well out of the box, not a lot of drama. Uh, as Ted mentioned, this has the 3.1 firmware on there that added the, uh, the new tone mapping that JVC introduced at Cedia this last year. This adds frame by frame and scene by scene tone mapping to the projector at no cost to previous owners or for new owners. It also added some anamorphic modes for the Panamorph DCR lens. Uh, I did the calibration both for SDR and for HDR. Uh, I think today we're mainly going to be comparing HDR images. Um, I'm using the new frame by frame mode and I'm calibrated it with the uh, wider color gamut so the filter is in place. Um, I did not calibrate the Optima. Uh, we did do a rough uh, light matching where we're trying to make sure that subjectively they're the same brightness on screen, but TED and, uh, and TVS really didn't want to do what I would call a scientific objective testing between the two or comparison. This is just JVC set up properly, they're set up the way that it would expect it to be set up for their customer, and then we can subjectively compare different images with it and talk about the differences that we see on screen. Thanks, Chris. And for those who don't know, the Theo and the Theo Lite um, has three differences between the regular Optima. The first one is we insert a 12th generation uh, cinema filter, which we call Pure Chrome. We help develop it. And the second thing we do is we are able to redo the way that they tone map to the screen. We wanted to favor more of the mid-tones and the skin tones, and I think you'll be able to see that. And then the third thing we do is we are able to reduce the reflections inside the light box somewhat so that our black level is even significantly lower than a normal unmodified Optima. So with that, let's begin. Great. comes up here on this clock tower because there's a lot of detail in this clock tower. Now one of the reasons we like to use this scene is this is shot with a red camera at 8K and it was actually the digital intermediary was done at 4K so it has some of the best detail we've seen on a disc and I, I don't know we'll, we'll take a couple of close-ups for our blog on our uh, web page as well so you can see it closer but there are actually very fine verticals here, a lot of detail in this clock face, um, in these buildings. Um, Chris, what are you seeing over there? Well, I'm trying to view it more from like a standard seating distance as opposed to at the screen. Um, some things that jump out right away, um, obviously there is some differences in the calibration here that, that you know, are, are, are kind of tough, but uh, the first thing that caught my eye is the bottom section of the scene in the round um, here. Um, so am I allowed to come up and point? Oh, yeah, please. Um, if you look at this, the, the, the texture and the rock compared to the two, um, at least from back there, this one looks a little more natural, I think, than that. It's the same with the front of this building compared to that one. It looks a little smeary on here, I thought, compared to back there on this one. But on the fine detail that you were talking about, um, the differences between the two are slighter than I thought. I thought with the single chip you would have a little bit more of a, that real tight, but they really are super close, which says a lot for the fact that that's a shifting, you know, not a true 4K, that it's coming as close to, to the two. Um, but really, I'm seeing more from the differences in the calibration. I think that's really bringing out the reds in the, you know, in the Optima here. The red is a lot different than it is here, but that, um, at yeah. least from a seating distance, looks a little off. We'll talk a little bit more when we get into the color section, but in terms of detail, uh, at viewing distance, say they both look somewhat, fantastic. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm agree. I, we're looking at two very different technology. One is yeah. three uh, Lycos, the other is single chip, one is laser, one is lamp based. So to have them that close, that's just been amazing to me. Okay, in this scene, we're still looking at detail. We're going to go from a very dark scene 
And then we're going to let this roll and we're going to frame it as it goes into the, the slightly brighter scene. Again, this is from Mortal Engines. We're going to freeze it there. You're going to see some differences in the, the uh, calibration, as Chris said, and also the color gamuts that we use. But also, we're, we're still comparing detail in terms of, in this case, we get lots of wrinkles to compare. Chris, what are you seeing? Uh, with the, well, are we just talking about this scene just, or the dark just scene? Just detail, just detail in this scene. Um, so in this scene here, um, I, again, you're getting into where the detail looks so close that the differences that I see have more to do with the calibration looking at her lips you know, the one on the right has that, that darker red because your red is, is quite a bit, you know, different than the, the JVC's is. Um, but as far as the textural, it looks about the same. I'm also looking at the, what looks like the small texture to the left of her nose on that little bit of the cheek that you can see. Um, again, like the JVC, because of the toe mapping, is a little bit brighter where yours is, looks a little bit redder. But... I'm not seeing as much difference. I think her chin looks a little more natural where it looks a little hard on the, the one on the right where there it looks a little more natural. Where that, you see what I mean? Where it yep, looks yep, slightly yep. processed. That, that's our tone curve we'll talk about in a little yeah. bit. We're, we're gonna, but we're gonna on the one harsh. on the right, when you look at her, it's hard to explain it, the hair to the, this part of her hair uh, to the left of the darker part, the strands look a little more defined on the one on the right to me oh than the one on the left um there's a little bit more definition uh there on the one on the right um but outside of that the differences are pretty small um yeah i would say the the same thing as what i was noticing and we wanted to revisit this first darker scene because this is a great example of what's happening with the adaptive tone mapping of frame by frame. Chris, give us your analysis. Yeah, so uh, one thing for the viewers at home, um, ignore the lights to the right of the image on the left because um, that's the overlap of the Optima. So it, right where those lights to the left of there starts is the JVC. Um, those lights would be on the left side off of the frame. Now, um, this is a great example of what frame by frame does. Now a static tone map, they work pretty well. They've gotten better over time, but you have to remember that the, the way that a static tone map works is that you're always optimizing to essentially the brightest frame that you would get in the movie. Um, so you're, you know, you're trying to pick the, the brightest scene in a movie and optimize for that which thereby means you're compromising every scene that isn't that scene. As it gets darker, you're essentially adding dynamic range in that you don't need, which thereby makes it dark. Um, so here is a great example of that. If you look at their, the face of the, uh, of the man, um, one, it's a completely different type of lighting. You're seeing more specular highlight in his eyes because you're not compromising the range for, the, for a scene that we're not on right now. And that brings way more detail into his face, not only the delineation of his beard, uh, the delineation of the wrinkles in his neck, the way his cheeks are, the one on the left. It, it, it just makes a big difference because with a frame by frame, you're not wasting dynamic range. All of the dynamic range is being optimized for the scene that you're looking at, as opposed to a scene that might only be one second of the movie on the one on the right. So that's, that's one thing to always keep on is the whole point of frame by frame is to not waste dynamic range. And in this case, you're seeing what happens when you do that. And, and it's a, like we said, it's a huge improvement what JVC's done with this adaptive frame. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're going to take a look at this still frame from a 4K footage. And we've used this before, so we wanted to show it um, and compare the, this is like a resolution chart. So we love this because the stairs are like vertical resolution chart and the pose and the fine detail in the building uh, allows us to really look at both the processing, the lens, and the actual detail. So Mike, if you'll point out some of the detail you're seeing. So a couple of the places that we like to look at here across the stairs, um, horizontally like Ted mentioned, um, as well as the uh, railing section through here. It's nice to be able to see those lines. And there's actually, you probably won't see it from there, but if we take some close-up steels, there's actually railings here um, in these individual and then across through there that are, um, uh, you know, you can actually even see that. And, and Chris, uh, 
tell me if I'm wrong or, or what do you think? I, I, I think both of them are doing a rather good job. Yeah, I think they both look excellent. And uh, um, the one thing I want to point out again for the, uh, the viewers here that aren't really that familiar with technology when it comes to display technology, the two projectors that we're comparing here, the JVC is what's called a three-chip projector. So it uses a different DILA imaging pattern for red, green, and blue, and then overlaps the three onto the screen. Uh, the DLP is using a single chip uh, imaging device, so it only goes through that. So you're not converging three chips onto each other. So that tends to typically give a single chip device a much higher uh, resolution because you're, you don't have any of the bleed over from the three chips. So um, it's a testament to theirs. Now, the resolution on the Optima is only half of uh, true 4K, the chip they're using and then they're basically shifting uh, two images in real time so that your eye sees it as 4K. Um, each chip is in, uh, each pixel is individually addressable just like it is on a native 4K like the JVC, but they're going to occupy the same, a little bit of an overlap. So you're, if you, you won't really see it with normal material, but you will with test patterns. So they are slightly different in terms of this one is not a true 4K imaging chip. It is individually addressed pixels at 4K, where this is a true 4K. Um, so the testament to the Optima is how good it looks compared to an actual true 4K device. But the testament to the JVC is that even though these are three uh, panels converged onto each other, uh, we were talking earlier, even on the, the smallest single pixel items like these little antennas here, there is absolutely no bleed over that you're seeing, whether it's chromatic aberration or convergence between the three chips. They look identical between the single chip and the three chip. Um, so we're really not seeing on this sample of the JVC really any convergence or even chromatic aberration errors um, that, that, sh that stand out over the single chip. And yeah. Chris, I think just to, just to point out, and I think maybe you already mentioned this, that the, the single chip DLP 4K, of course, that's also different than 4K enhancement or an E-shift or something. Well, it, it, um, it, is, an e, it is a technically the same as what JVC was doing with E-shift. They're using a, an optical actuator, a piece of glass, and then the chip uh, in the DMD, each pixel is being addressed individually, and then that, that actuator shifts the image so, so fast your eye can't see it. So it's, it's showing the two and they slightly overlap each other. And in this case, this chip is half the resolution of 4K. So it's, it's a shift in one direction. There's another version that uses a 1080p DMD and that shifts four times as opposed to two times on this. Um, so the E-shift on the JVC used a 1080p uh, as well, but it was only shifting twice, mm -hmm. whereas their 1080p is shifting four times to get you. So you have more inherent resolution on the screen than you did with the E-shift version of the JVC or an E-shift version from Epson or anybody else that's using that right. with like a three-chip right. solution. Right, and that, that explains some of the differences because when we looked on this on, on both the the shifting uh, LCDs and the shifting Lycos, they couldn't reproduce some of those fine columns in those. Absolutely. Like the that. DLP shifting is the closest uh, uh, shifting solution by far to a true native 4K chip. In fact, like I said, you're really only going to see the differences in like the most difficult test patterns that they are. In normal content, you're just not going to see the differences yeah, at all. I, I agree. Okay, this is just uh, as we get into evaluating and looking at the color differences between these. Again, we do our own mapping, which is different than the normal uh, UHD 65, the Optima. And, and in the next video we do after this one, we'll actually be comparing those two. Uh, but here you can see we're, we're rolling off the highlights. Now, 75 is 1,000 nits, so we're starting to roll off just before then. And we can just barely see 77. We're gone at 78. But inside our tone, uh, th this is the detail within each color. And we've tried to optimize it because we are not able to dynamically change it through the scene. Whereas the JVC, and Chris, you can tell us a little bit more about the dynamic tone mapping. Yeah, so on a JVC, they're doing a dynamic frame by frame. So one, they're ignoring the metadata on this. The metadata on this disk is 1,000 nits. Uh, but you can see it goes past that because it's seeing information that actually goes past 
what the disc is authored to. And right now we have the right side of the image on the JVC cut off for this, um, but you would see it would extend all the way out. Um, the, um, you are seeing some clipping in red. It starts, it looks like it starts clipping out about here and then green. Green extends all the way out, blue, and a tone map is going to treat each one of those different, how it messes with the luminance and the saturation of a color um, is going to have this change. But you also have to keep in mind that the idea of having anything near a thousand nits of red is very uh, unlikely. Um, you have to remember that a thousand nits white, you know, you're only talking about 70 nits of blue. You're talking about 240 nits of red with a thousand nits of white. So the odds that you would ever even see color that gets anywhere near these kind of luminance points is pretty much a moot, uh, a moot issue. So this image is from the uh, diversified video HDR10 calibration disc. This is a still frame. Um, but this is a good one to explain why we're doing the tone mapping we're doing. We wanted to favor the mid-tones and the skin tones. Um, and of course we're emphasizing color because the, the filter we're using is giving us very wide color gamut and particularly in the cyans and the blues. But if the skin tones aren't right when you look at a movie or a subject, um, everything else just seems a little bit off. So that's why we did what we did. And Chris, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the JVC. Yeah, here. so the JVC in this case, uh, as most people know, everything that we see in HDR uh, to up to this point pretty much has been P3 within 2020. Um, when we measured the calibration for the JVC, um, you're looking at a delta E well below perceptible to the eye, even at the highest delta E, which was at 100% saturations. When you're talking about inside, we were down into the ones and stuff like that. So um, the, uh, the Optoma, when we looked at it, it definitely has a lot of skewing as it goes through the percentages and stuff. And that's just because, it, you know, it, it, the limitations of the design and where they put the color filter in there. But it still looks pretty balanced. But you'll start to see, you know, what happens is, is when you start clipping into a color, everything stacks onto each other. So if you look here, the cyan looks like a, a, a deeper cyan where this is more of like where it actually should be. Um, colors that tend to clip on top of each other, they stack. So the same value is always represented as it goes down until, it, it, until it's out of there. Um, but uh, the tone map also changes some stuff here. You can see the light next to her isn't as blown out as it looks like on there. The highlights here stand out a little bit more than they do on there. But this is exactly, you know, this is an actually technically calibrated image as opposed to what they're doing to kind of like rough in their calibration and stuff like that. It, but the two, you know, side by side, the differences are a little bit more obvious than I think you would have seen if you were just looking at one or the other. Yes, thank you. So um, this is technically correct and we call this a balanced calibration. This mm -hmm. is how we send them out. You could have it recalibrated but most people in this price range are not going to do that. So we, we've set it up uh, specifically to favor skin tones. We'll take a look at a couple yeah. other shots. And another thing to look at here is this was, you know, done with the Pantone thing, but this was a D65 gray, if I remember, as the backdrop on here. And you can see with the JVC, it actually looks gray, where here it starts to look a greenish hue to it and stuff like that. And, and again, that's going to offset the way the colors look and everything else. So it's just the differences in calibration. Yes. Okay, this is an image that I think we've used in a couple other videos, so we wanted to use this as a reference again. This shows our tone mapping. This is the Theo Light. Um, we've really gone specifically after the skin tone. That's the one thing that uh, our eyes are very susceptible to. Uh, and you can see the uh, extreme color differences between the deep magenta and the cyan. Um, we're, we're just discussing a little bit. We're not sure how yellow that cauliflower is. The JVC definitely has a little more yellow there. Chris, any other thoughts? Uh, no, I agree. The, the cauliflower is a little, you know, the JVC, it has a yellowish tinge to it where the Optima looks more white, which is what I would expect from a cauliflower. Obviously, we don't have the reference image to know what that's supposed to look like. You see it also in the flesh tones of her face. Um, the highlights look a little more white on her face on the Optima, a little yellowish more on the JVC. Um, they both actually look really great. Now, tone mapping really shouldn't affect this image at all, except if you're pushing the luminance down because the average picture level here, there, there's probably not even any highlight information that exceeds 100 nits in here. So this would be pretty close to what I would expect with HDR. You are getting the wide color gamut, 
but I, I doubt other than maybe that, that little silver bag that's to the bottom left um, where you're probably getting anything in this image that would exceed uh, an SDR or luminance range. So, but uh, yeah, there are definitely some differences here. Uh, be, it'd be interesting to see what a master reference of this picture is. This is a scene from the 4K UHD Jumanji disc. Again, um, the JVC on the left is precisely calibrated. What you're looking at is the Theo light on the right. Um, and we've, we've tone mapped and arranged the, the way it reproduces uh, HDR so that it favors skin tones. Chris? Yeah, so looking at this, it's interesting. The uh, the Optima has a little it has. We already knew it's it's more saturated on red and it's more saturated on green. I think your gamut it makes it extend a little bit out. And in these scenes, it's making it look like it it has more color pop to it. Um, but some of the things I have noticed is is that you lose detail, like the reflection there on his head looks clipped on yours is not as clipped on the JVC. The clouds in the background looked clipped on yours and stuff like that. But as far as I could see most people subjectively liking that, that little bit more of the uh, saturation on the colors on the right, even though they're not accurate, you, you, you understand what I mean? Like it would be the favor oh, of like, yep. you see it really there with the greens have a little bit more of a lush look to them. The reds have a little bit more of a lush to them. Um, but this is also something where, um, I don't remember what the APL is on this. If we go to... This might be one where I've been leaving the frame by frame on the JVC to auto, which uh, defaults to medium. If I put this to high, it would probably look more in line. Now, you see what I mean? Yep. Um, because yep. there is that, that's one of the downsides of their frame by frame is that it's not taking into account how much light you have. Now, you can see by putting this in high, um, it's drastically different now, where now the left side looks like it has more pop than the right side does. Um, and that is one of the kind of the drawbacks of the, uh, the JVC one is that it, it's not optimized based on your actual measured white. You have to figure out which frame by frame mode to work um, for a specific movie. So, um, and you can see here the saturation like on the red of his scarf still looks better on the right side, but you can see now the image looks like it has a little more pop on the left. Again, we're evaluating color now. And, and in this scene from Guardians of the Galaxy 2, I think we've used this before, but we use this to show um, some of our extended color. We go actually a little bit beyond P3, specifically in the magenta, which is affecting the purple, and our cyans are very, very deep. Um, we're gonna roll this and actually freeze this when we get all five characters in the screen and talk about it a little bit. Um, this is when the spacecraft is uh, arriving and rockets getting prepared to defend themselves. And just coming up right here, uh, that's a great shot there. And as she comes around, I'm going to move a couple of frames here. There we go. So that they're all in focus. And um, this gives you, again, uh, we have set the calibration to favor skin tones. And we err on the side of pink, which is what you're seeing there. Um, and our extended color, again, you can see in greens. And Chris, tell us what the JVC is doing. So again, you're seeing the difference between a frame by frame and a static. The left side obviously looking, you know, uh, a, a brighter image overall. Um, static tone mapping, the, the number one complaint is that, you know, it, it tends to look dark. And, and in this scene, you can see it. Um, but it's hard to judge color because obviously our perception of color is, uh, uh, hinges a lot on how bright it is. So the fact that you have two different brightnesses here, um, you're going to see that the one on the right looks, uh, you know, because it's darker, the colors look darker, um, where the colors on the left side look brighter, um, so they're not as deep, I guess is the word you'd put. You could see that on Gamora's face, the green is a little lighter on the, light, on the left side than it is. The red is a little bit more saturated on the right, um, because again, but your red is actually a little more uh, saturated when we measure it as well. Right. Um, but you also see where you start losing detail on the, I, I always forget her name in the middle, but on her chest there, you know, here I can clearly make out that that's like a, a black mesh that's over her purple outfit on the right side. You can barely even tell that there's a mesh there at all. Um, just little d differences like that. But a lot of what you're seeing is your perception of color is being skewed here by the luminance differences between the two.
Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> um, and what what brightness mode of the JVC are we in now? Are We're we in still auto? in the high. And okay. another thing to point out, if you look at that, uh, I, I pointed this out earlier when we were looking at it, in the menu where it, you know, because we're paused from not from Missouri, you can see the starburst underneath it and yours for some reason, we're not seeing any yellow at all. And on the one on the JVC, you can clearly see that each has a yellow dot on it and then there's a yellow overlay for the pause thing. So differences in saturation, and that might be from the, the accuracy, it could be from the tone map, it's hard to say. Now, if we take the JVC, I, again, I went to high. If we just use auto, which is going to default to medium, it's probably gonna put it closer to what yours looks like. Now you can see it still preserves that yellow in the menus, but in terms of the, uh, the overall image now, that brightness starts to go away. And again, that's a, the JVC is not optimized based on the actual measured brightness level of the projector with their frame by frame. They don't have an option to tell you if you measure this, use this. So auto always defaults to medium. And I picked high because I think anybody that was here watching this, if they had to pick between low, medium, and high, would pick high. Yeah, I agree. Yep, yep. Thanks. This is a scene from Toy Story 4. Uh, again, this is, now we're looking at uh, contrast and blacks. This is a very difficult scene to do if your projector has a milky look to it where a lot of the, the 4K unmodified LCD projectors are gonna look somewhat milky here. Here we're able to compare it with one of the best blacks in the industry with the JVC on the left. Um, and again, we've, we've balanced our brightness towards the mid-tones. What kind of differences are you seeing, Chris? Well, uh, one big caveat that the, 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 anybody watching this needs to know is that um, this room is definitely not an optimal room for the JVC. So you are Absolutely. compromising its overall dynamic range right away. This room is a, more of a white room. Um, it is controlling the black level uh, drastically compared to what the JVC could be doing. Um, but in terms of like this scene with shadow detail and everything, they they actually look very similar to each other um, because of that. Um, you know, I'm not seeing anything getting lost in the background. I'm not getting that normal milky-ish look that you typically get from a DLP and stuff like that. But this isn't. This scene isn't really real, real dark. Um, there's some other scenes that might show that a little bit more than this. But so far, uh, uh, both look uh, fantastic with this. Okay, so this is a scene, another scene from uh, Mortal Engines. Um, it's at night, and we're looking at the way each of these projectors is processing this image. There's some bright highlights there, and then you're going to see they're going to release the, the resurrected man, and he's going to be coming out through this darkness in the ocean. Fairly low level scene there. And then the light. Seen any significant differences there? Uh, well, the biggest differences I'm seeing is in the color and the tone mapping again. Like the color on the JVC, like a lot of those, the red looked overdriven and clipped on the Theo where it looked more natural on the JVC. Um, shadow detail looks about the same in this scene that we're looking at here. Um, I'm, you know, I'm seeing a little bit more in his outfit on the tone map on the left, but you know, you know, they both look pretty good. But when you started the clip, some of the reds looked overdriven and stuff like that. So, you know, calibration comes into account way more than the actual contrast that I'm seeing on the screen. I'm going to move this a few frames forward. We're going to get us some lightning strike here, so then we get kind of out of the darks, but it's kind of interesting to see how they handle those brights and those highlights there. And you can see the reflection on his shoulder there. And the, yeah, see, almost there, the they details. almost look identical now with that higher light. Yep, as the light level goes up. that looks, stands out really a lot more in one than the other. Um, I'm seeing what looks like a little bit of banding underneath the lightning on the right image at the far right there. I can't really tell. Uh, it's not there on the left. See what I'm talking about, like color gradation? Yeah. And I'm not Love seeing that on the JVC at all. Not, not really sure, like to the, to the yeah. bottom right. Yeah. yeah. That, um, that I'm not seeing on the, uh, on the JVC. But outside of that, they look very similar. Now, as you go darker and darker, 
Yeah, the, these, these all look fairly similar. Okay, we're going to explore some of those really near dark scenes because a lot of people want to know, well, gee, if this little Theo looks that good, why would you want the JVC? The JVC is a whole nother level of darks and black floor, and that's what we're going to show you in this scene, and I'm going to let Chris kind of explain that to you as this plays. So the scene we're about to look at is actually a sequence of scenes. We're going to start here, and it's more of a daylight scene. The next scene will go to dusk, then night, and then really dark. And what you're going to see not only is the contrast advantage that the JVC has really near black, which is already being limited by the room that we're in, but you'll also see what the tone mapping does. Um, a lot of people, when they compare HDR tone mapping solutions, they don't understand that mid-grade scenes, like which most content is, 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 is difficult, and you will see differences in, in different tone maps, but you really need to see with the extremes. What does it do with a really difficult, really dark scene? What does it do with something that's extremely bright? So in the scene that's coming up, we'll see what it does with a really difficult dark scene, and then later we'll show you something that does with a really bright. So we're going to let this play, and this is more of like middle of the day. It is an overcast day, as you can see behind them. It's just a clouded sky. And then the next scene will be more of like a dusk scene along the riverbank. And um, you'll see little differences in the detail, but here you're really, the, the big thing that stands out between the two is the color saturations, um, where the uh, Theo is, it looks very bluish, where the... Uh, the JVC has a little bit more of a natural hue to it uh, in natural uh, uh, natural lighting that this was shot in. Um, so you go down. So if you really like a real punchy color or something like that, this is what you see. But you'll see it affects everything, not just the water, uh, and uh, and that's that's a problem. Uh, so now, so that's dusk. So now we're getting a little bit closer to night. So not only are you seeing the difference there, but look at how much more color it can maintain in the saturation of that flame. And now we'll get to the extreme dark. So if I just pause it, we'll let that sit, and then the, the menu will go away. You'll really see where the two stand out from each other. So on the, uh, the Theo, there's really, like once you get past his face, it just looks like kind of a grayish mess. Uh, it's hard to make out the fact that he has a fur on um, or anything near his collar or anything let alone the highlight information on his face itself. Um, on the JVC, not only can you really make out the detail on his face, but you can make out that that is a fur that he's laying, and then the details in that shirt that he has underneath his neck. And Chris, as you were talking, I was bringing up the ISO so we could start to see that background because we yeah. weren't, even though I was at 3200 ISO, we still weren't seeing it. Now you're beginning to see the difference in those two blacks. Yeah. And in the face. And if anybody was here looking at this in person, it would probably be even more dramatic than it's going to be in the camera. Definitely, definitely. The camera can only really expose to one of them at a time. The other thing that this scene would have if we weren't splitting the image the same is his head is resting on a tree that has moss on it. Now you can make out more of the tree on the Theo side that there's more thing, but you really can't see it at all. You just see a tiny bit of texture above his head. If you were looking at the JVC and you could already start to make it, you could see the texture of the bark right above his head starting up, but you would actually be able to see that it's a green moss that's going down the tree. And then in the background, you would start to see the shadow detail where you're losing that to the room because the room is, is lighting it, but you would actually see the tree line behind and the small textures in the trees behind him. And so this scene is one of the most difficult scenes that there is out there for really low light and to see how a tone map handles it. And you can see from, I'm looking at the image on the camera, the background differences in the black. The skin tones um, are actually different than what we're seeing with our eye. With our eye, we're seeing on the left in the JVC that it's a warmer skin tone. It's interesting, the camera is, is picking them up so where the JVC is actually a little colder than it is on the right. But in reality, the JVC is a little bit warmer, and that's just the way the, the camera's yeah, picking it up. You really make out the little highlight around his eye. You really see all that little detail from because he's a he has a burn on his face. So you're seeing the scarring of that burn, and you really see it below his eye where a lot of that detail, I mean, it's there. If you just saw the other one, you might be able to make it out, but it's really pronounced all of that detail in the dark. And I've just brought our exposure, our ISO up to 10,000, so you can continue to see how the JVC is holding blacks even better than what we're doing in the Theo, although 
Um, this is probably about as extreme a black scene as I've ever seen. I think yeah, this Chris a, brought this, this with him. Test. I use this to test tone maps all the time. So the other thing that, uh, again, that we've talked about where people talk about bright, you know, I want a brighter projector for HDR. Well, the problem with a brighter projector for HDR is it raises your blacks. And really what you want is more dynamic range. And this is another great example. Not only are you getting, you know, the black is significantly blacker than what you're seeing on the field, but look at how much brighter the get up because you're seeing a bigger difference between black and white. And that's what dynamic range is. It's not just about the black, it's about the difference between objects. And the more contrast that you have near black, the more you start to see all those differences and instead of that gray mass that just, because it just doesn't have enough range in that area. Right. So uh, until you see something like this in person, it's almost indescribable because most people are not used to ever seeing what it can look like. Right, right. And, and thank you for bringing that up. We have, if you go to our website, we have an invitation. We'll actually, if you want to come see this in person, because that's really the only way when you get into scenes like this that you can appreciate the differences that we're seeing, is we'll refund your travel cost up to $600 if you end up buying one of the 10 projectors listed on our website, including the unmodified Theo now and also the NX5, which is very similar to this projector, but without as wide a gamut and without the dual irises. So this is another scene from Guardians of the Galaxy 2. We're going to be moving from this very bright scene to a dark, uh, we're first a uh, night sky, and then we're going to go to a very dark forest. And the reason we're doing it uh, is we want to evaluate how the iris in the JVC, how smooth it tracks, and how the laser dimming is operating in the JVC. So we're going to roll this in the, and the, in the Theo, yeah. The menu, we want that to disappear because that can affect the iris in the dimming. So it's going to go from this bright scene into this night sky, and then as the camera pans down, you're going to see both of them do a very smooth, gradual change. Yeah, you can definitely see just a slight bit of the, the jerkiness of the iris as it clamped down there. It wasn't perfectly smooth, but I wouldn't have expected it to. I don't know if you But it's not distracting, yeah, I, don't I don't think. Yeah, I don't think you would uh, notice it unless you were looking for it. And, um, you know, in the Theo and the Optima, if you go to a more extreme dimming, you will see stepping, but we're, we're using its lighter dimming in this case. And the purpose is, again, to show you how smooth both of those are. Okay, we're going to now be looking at some HDR scenes. We're starting out here very, very bright, but it's going to go to a dark ceiling inside and some, some very dramatic lighting. So we're going to go from this, and it's, we're just playing this along here. You can see the, the differences in the tone mapping and the brightness, the way we've calibrated it, and the way the, this is the scene we want to really look at here. And, and Chris, I was just mentioning, um, I wouldn't want a projector brighter than that uh, in terms of 30-foot candles, in a, in especially if this room were really dark, as it's going to be. Don't you think 30-foot candles is enough? Uh, it is an interesting uh, a point. Now, again, you can't apply a single number to every viewing situation because the amount of ambient light in the room, the amount, like, what the, the, the walls are like. So if you're talking about home cinema, where you have a room that's very black, you know, like really, really well light controlled, uh, darker walls and everything, obviously the light coming from the screen is really more dramatic than it is when you're having a lot of ambient light around it. Um, so 30 foot Lamberts is about twice as much as we were getting with SDR. So it provides plenty of headroom for the dynamics of the, you know, as you're tone mapping. But it also is kind of a, a, an upper area where some people will find that if you have big swing transitions between something very dark to something really bright, where it can cause a, a painfulness to the eyes and everything else. Once, like with something like the JVC where you have an adjustable aperture, once you hit about 30 or low 30s for foot Lamberts in a really dark room, I would actually rather start closing the iris down and increasing the overall dynamic range rather than actually getting a brighter image for highlights because they're really already bright enough, you know, that the tone map doesn't have any problems with clipping or anything like that. And, and this is what I really love about HDR is all the tonal values from this bright highlight, which to our eyes here in person, it looks bright on both projectors, and yet we're able to see detail in those dark 
shelves in there. It, it's, you yeah, know, and it's. There's, there's a lot of folks that, you know, I, I just heard something from a guy that works at Dolby where he's saying that HDR is kind of being wasted in, in uh, movies because average picture level for HDR in cinema content like this is pretty much similar to what it was with SDR. You're just getting the highlight information. And he's saying, well, real life is a lot brighter than this. So we really want, why aren't we taking advantage of the higher APL? But the problem with that is that in real life, it's very rare that we transition from one extreme to another. Um, one of the only times I can really think of a, of a test case for that is if you go to a movie, um, if you're in a movie theater and your eyes are really acclimated to a really dark viewing environment and then you walk out the exit side. room yeah. and what happens, everybody's like, oh, ow, and, and, and everything like that. We don't want that in that because it's not comfortable to watch. And movies will transition from, you know, the inside of a, a dark cave where you barely can see anything to the next scene, they're on a beach, you know, and then the next scene could be, you know, a dim lit room like this. And then the next scene could be, you know, somewhere else that's super bright. And you, in real life, we don't have those transitions. So if your overall average picture level is just high all the time, um, those swings would just be, would be way too hard. Now, I think that that would be a fantastic thing for like a VR environment where they wanted to replicate something with HDR to make you feel like you were in the real world. But again, you would probably be more the real world where like, look at you're walking around this outside and look at these levels of light they're very the same but we don't have that with cinema content right and this hdr this is a still um and as chris was just explaining to us this isn't really a full range hdr but we love the color in this which is one of the reasons we're showing it but there is a difference in terms of the highlights because what we have done in our calibration is really favored the midtones which is in here Whereas the JVC has left more headroom, I believe, because isn't, don't you think, Chris, that that's a brighter highlight up there? Well, it's actually the opposite. So oh. when you think that it has more headroom, headroom means that you have padding, right? So if you have a dynamic range in a, in a, in a video signal, in a static one, you know, your dynamic range is from here to here because you're reserving all that headroom for the bright part, right? But if this, like I said, when you started this clip up, this really isn't that much of an HDR. I bet you if you saw an SDR version of this, it would almost look identical. But because yours is reserving this much headroom, if you look at, you know, kind of think of this as a scale, well, the JVC is frame by frame, so it's looking at this and saying, well, I don't really need to waste all this dynamic range. The, the peak white here is only down to here. So what happens is the peak white looks brighter on this than it does on yours because yours is reserving headroom, which makes it go down. Mm -hmm because now your white's mapped somewhere around here instead of your, your true peak of your projector, where here it's saying, well, you know, I, I'm just going to make this where the peak white is because, you know, it, I can. So again, it's all about maximizing dynamic range. A static tone map always has the same amount. So anything in here is always lower than the peak of the projector. But a dynamic one will sit there and map that to the peak so that this doesn't get that grayish kind of like you know what I mean? Clamp yeah. down look yeah, yeah, is what yeah. I always call it. And that's what a pad does. Um, and even in a dynamic system, they have to have a little bit of a pad because you don't know if the next scene's going to go really bright. You don't want to see a huge jumps and you'll get pumping just like a dynamic iris would. And, um, and so there's still probably a little bit of pad compared to a perfect static for this scene. Right. Um, what, what we love about this scene is the wide color because we have a little bit yeah, of extended greens. greens. We're pulling them out here and... I don't know that that's wide gamut, but it sure pops. Yeah, that nice orange. Uh, yeah. Yep, and then, of course, your red's in there a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it's hard to say without seeing it on a spectral. But you're, you are seeing that your reds, you know, we've commented a few times, is the wood has more of a red to it than here, where it looks more, brown, you know, more yeah. of a woodish brown and stuff like that. And that's just, again, the differences in the calibration. This is, again, technically calibrated to, you know, pretty much perfect, and yours has quite a bit of variation. But it still has a pretty natural balance compared to a lot of uncalibrated projectors I've seen in the past. So this is the other end of the HDR spectrum. This is super bright content that Chris brought with him. Um, this is the movie Meg, and we've got it freeze-framed here so you can see the difference in how we're rolling off highlights. That is a very, very bright scene, and it's also very difficult to photograph, but from what I'm seeing here, other than some of the banding you're seeing, which is not what we're seeing live, in terms of banding that's moving. We're seeing it on both of them and it's kind of fixed on the JVC. 
but what we're focusing on is what you're seeing within the highlights. Yes, and, and not only does the MEG have highlights in terms of like a specular highlight, it's, it's extremely high average picture level. So it's very difficult because when everything is bright, you have to try and figure out how to get dynamic range out of that. Um, in, in this case, the Theo is just kind of blown out in the center. You can barely make out that there's a cage there. On the left side, it looks like you can clearly make out the cage. You can see it goes from a bright object in the center to just a nice uniform out to the water. And then as, it, as we come down, it's the same thing. So then you get to hear on the JVC that you can actually make out the skyline. There are some clouds in it. But the other thing is the water. The water actually has texture to it, has a nice blue where the Theo, there really is no sky. It just looks like it's a white overcast. And then the water loses a lot of texture in there. It's just either white or little, little uh, variations of it. So you lose a lot of detail in there. Um, and then as we, as we go down deeper, you'll start to see a little bit of contouring with the Theo that you're not really seeing on the JVC there. So I'm gonna go past this scene to the next one. It's another one that's pretty brutal. Um, on the JVC on the sky, you can make out that it's a blue sky with white clouds. Again, I don't know how much of this translates to what you see on the, on the, on the camera. Uh, and on the Theo side, you can kind of make out that there's some clouds, but there's really no blue sky at all. The water line is almost kind of blurs into the clouds. And then there's really not a lot of definition to the darker part of the boat compared to the white part. And then again, the texture of the water as you come up to it. And that's just, again, on the fly tone mapping that's balancing it out. You really see it here, like his, his skin tones, the detail in the jacket, the detail in the hair. Um, this scene, it's pretty much the entire time you're going to see drastic differences because the fixed tone map just has a lot of problems with it. So if we come back to the guy, you'll see there's nothing behind him on the Theo and on the JVC, you see blue sky, you see clouds and you see the texture of the clouds, um, the texture of things. So again, the difference in the tone maps here really make it almost a completely different image um, as the frame by frame balances itself to what's there versus a, a static. So thanks for watching, and in conclusion, we just want to talk a little bit about what you, we've just experienced. Um, we have a whole new appreciation of the JVC firmware and the dynamic tone mapping, especially in the very, very bright scenes and the really, really dark scenes. But overall, um, hopefully this has been helpful for you. The reason we do these comparisons is so that clients can see um, the differences. These, these are not competitors for each other. Uh, they're in different price ranges, but that wide color gamut is what um, you know really got us excited about working with the Optima to create that wider color in a in a different price range. And Mike, what were your impressions? So I, it was amazing to see really how the uh, both projectors uh, did a, a great job overall. Uh, I was really uh, impressed with how well the JVC did uh after the calibration that chris was able to do and really how it shined in in so many of the scenes where i'd seen it before and it, it didn't really do what you know i had expected it to do and so that was neat but uh also the optima how well it, it really kind of held its own in in most of the the scenes you know obviously on those extremes is really where the differences are and that's you know one of the things that you're paying for but uh, but yeah, I think both both projectors did a, a, a well a, did a, a good job overall in in most of the content. Chris, um, first and foremost, I want to thank you guys for letting oh, me come you. out. You know, it was it was a great opportunity. I mean, not only you know to calibrate and make sure that you guys were kind of on there, but to to be in the room. And I think that not only did I bring the calibration for you guys, but I think that I I, I kind of helped educate you a little bit Big more time. on HDR. Oh yeah, well the uh, dynamic tone, tone mapping, mapping yeah, and, absolutely. And things like that, what to look for and seeing what a wide variety of content. I think that uh, most people, when they start looking at content, they tend to look at what I call the mid-range, the easy, the driving 55 content. Um, but really what separates products is how it handles extremes. How does it handle the dark? How does it handle the light? And in this case, we didn't even really see JVC with their real good blacks because of the room. And really right, that's sure. what they're known for. But you really got a sense of the fact that from a user perspective, I wanna sit down, turn on the TV and just watch whatever, not futz with the remote, not mess with the picture settings. 
The JVC delivers that. The frame by frame made it where it didn't matter what we put on. I didn't have to change the setting. I could fine tune it a little bit with which mode I was using, but you saw, no matter what, we were always looking at, well, what is the Theo doing that the JVC is not, that that's wrong? The JVC was always pretty much, we didn't find a lot of scenes where we were like, oh, the JVC is doing that wrong. And that's what it should be. It should be you sitting down, relaxing, and just watching the movie. I thought that Theo did a really great job at its price point. I, I think you're pointing a DLP projector in the right direction. You're trying to get a more balanced color as opposed to the, the garish, brilliant color that we typically see with the DLP. The filter helped out with that. It helped with the perception of blacks because it's like an ND filter. Um, you know, it, and again, at laser at that price point, it's a really nice value and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, again, that ease of use, what happens when you start getting to the more difficult content, you really start to see its flaws. Now, the other thing to always remember is we're looking at them side by side. Most people never look at that. They're just going to put a Theo in their room and watch it. They're going to put a JVC in their room and watch it. And how many of these things that they would see, I think the clipping would definitely be a problem. But some of the finer points and stuff, you know, most likely, you know, when you compare side by side, it's an issue. But uh, I thought both of them did really, really well. But at the end of the day, uh, a kudos to JVC. They've just really taken that frame by frame, really puts them apart. Half. Not only mm -hmm. the Theo, but the Sonys, the BenQs, the Epsons and stuff. They all do a good job at certain things. But with HDR, that frame by frame really just makes it where you can sit back, relax, not have to worry about it, push play and just enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, definitely a significant tick up in terms of HDR performance. So again, thanks for watching. Be sure and check our website. We'll have a blog with some of the close-up still images that we've taken during this. And be sure and look at the uh, projector challenge, which we invite you to come here and see these in person and we'll help compensate that if you end up buying one of these and, and we can be competitive on those. So thanks a lot.